So Heidegger warns us about technology, but he also is is a, like thinks about it in a way that we tend not to think about it. And people still tell me this today. Technology is just a tool, okay? It's just a tool for this or that. But it's actually not just a tool because it is impacting human beings at a physiological level. We create technology, but then technology helps, it informs us and creates us too. So that there's a mutual, um, there's a mutuality working that Heidegger was trying to get at with talking about technology. If we don't understand this, we will have issues. So Nietzsche called giving into the synchronicity as a belief, the greatest danger. Okay, but if we're looking at synchronicity and the different theories of synchronicity, or the ways in which we take synchronicity, because a lot of people take synchronicities as signs that they're on some path, right? And I call synchronicity in religious studies the engine of belief, the engine of spiritual and religious belief, because you find it in every tradition. I opened the book in New Mexico at a alleged crash site of a UFO, which I did not believe in. And so this person who was associated with the, he worked for the space program and he had lots of different jobs. And he said that this was his hobby, which was studying UFOs. And so he asked me, oh, one thing, how I met this person was that he actually approached me because he believed that, he said that his field was actually gonna need information from my field in order to understand what he was studying. And so he thought that the people in religious studies who knew, had data about mystical experiences and consciousness and this type of thing, that would help him. So that's how he approached me. I, at this point, I met Gary Nolan, and it was Jacques Vallée who introduced me to Gary Nolan. And then Gary Nolan and Jacques work closely together on the topic of UFOs. And Gary Nolan is a professor at Stanford University. But we went out, so I went out to New Mexico. Um, Tyler asked me to go. He said, I feel like you don't believe in this, the physical reality of this. So I want to take you to a place where I'm going to prove that the physical reality of it beyond, you know, it is true. Everybody and welcome back to Chasing Consciousness. So today we have the ever more mainstream story of UFO experiences to assess. Not necessarily the important questions around the existence of the phenomena, which the Office of the US Director of National Intelligence confirmed in an official 2021 report that they were in fact a quote, population of objects, but rather the belief in the phenomenon. In 2008, polled at about 37% of Americans, but by no means confined just to the US. Now, this widespread belief, along with less ridiculed beliefs bolstered by the, the high probability of extraterrestrial civilizations more advanced than our own existing out there somewhere in the cosmos, has had a huge sociological and cultural influence on Western society. The modern myth all kicked off some 75 years ago with a series of alleged crashes in New Mexico perhaps most famously the Roswell story of 1947, and uh, the buzzing of the White House in Capitol Hill by an entire squadron of UFOs in 1952, seen on multiple radar scopes on multiple occasions and leading to chases by Air Force jets. Now, that story uh, about Washington was covered in Time magazine and over 300 newspapers at the time and those first very highly public reports led to a massive high point in public interest and concern, only to drop off after it was all denied as illusion by a US government report. Now, despite having had ebbs and flows since then, public interest has generally grown, uh, especially since the age of the internet and amateur research. So today, I want to put a sociological context to all of this quasi-religious belief understand the role of our perception of technology, get our heads around a rare example of a modern myth forming in real time in front of us, look at ways the phenomenon can be both physical and psychological at the same time, and examine various scientific, academic, and even philosophical doors into this confounding phenomena that 
no matter how much the skeptics deny it, it just won't go away. So when we study belief, we have to turn to Professor of Religious Studies at the University of North Carolina, Diana Pasolka. She's also the author of three books, uh, Heaven Can Wait, a book about purgatory, American Cosmic on scientists who believe in UFOs, and her new 2023 book, Encounters, on multidisciplinary academic approaches to the UFO phenomena and experiences with non-human intelligence. Now, I've always been mostly skeptical about the reports uh, because of the ridicule, but very open-minded and curious from a SETI point of view and uh, as a lover of sci-fi literature. But that was all changed uh, in late 2017 when there was a New York Times article about the USS Nimitz Tic Tac incident involving a craft with anomalous aerodynamic properties witnessed by multiple pilots and radar operators again on multiple occasions. And that article also revealed the Pentagon's top secret advanced aerospace threat identification program, which wasn't supposed to exist. Since then, I've started to keep a closer eye on things and see the changes in the US law, this transition in how Congress are treating the issue, how scientists are publicly opening up to the possibilities, and how various top military tech agency patents are attempting to create energy sources and propulsion systems that could imitate this utterly uh, bizarre UFO uh, aerial performance and the, the experiments that are being made based on some of this uh, advanced theoretical physics. And don't forget, listeners, that we talk about all the science of this in more detail with Stanford Medical School's immunologist, pathologist, and inventor Gary Nolan uh, in this series. So do check that out if you want a more technical point of view. But it is just so fascinating to watch the story unfold after decades of ridicule. So I can't wait to have a good chat about the philosophy and mythology of this issue. So without further ado, let's go. Professor Diana Postalka, welcome to Chasing Consciousness. Thank you so much for coming on. How are you? I'm well today. How are you? Thank you, actually, for bringing me on. Well, it's very, very generous of you. I know how many people are desperately trying to get your point of view at the moment. So thank you, Dana. Mm -hmm. Dana, I absolutely love to start asking my guests about the first pressing questions about life, the universe and everything. When they first became aware of their own thinking, usually sometime sort of seven, eight, nine, ten years old, what can you remember from that time that stands out that may be relevant when you consider where you've ended up? Okay. So some of my earliest memories where I knew I was thinking and that thinking, it was like a meta thinking. Well, I was pretty young and I just remember thinking about infinity and thinking that how could there be something, basically the question of how are we here? Not necessarily why are we here? That question came later, but how is it that we're here? How is it that there is no beginning, no end, or is there a beginning and an end? So these are the kinds of things. And I knew it was called infinity. I know that this was called, you know, an in, to think in infinite terms, even at that age. And I used to just think about that for a while um, and pretty much on a regular basis. So that's how I begin to, I would call it, initiate my mind for the hard questions. That's interesting. It reminds me of a, a physicist, uh, Vitaly, um, who's writing about the world as a neural network for a new physics theory, the world as a neural network. And he was saying that he thought about, a lot about infinity as a child, but that it kind of bugged him. He was kind of like, oh, I can't get my head around this. I'm going to have to study math to a high level. Yes, that's right. I couldn't get my head around it. I didn't give up. I just, I just, you know, <laughs> I think I still can't get my head around it. Yeah. So... By means of setting the scene for the listeners about your discipline of religious studies that you've spent your academic career in, tell us a little bit about theology research itself. Um, theologians, theologians don't usually try and prove or disprove whether a particular religious belief is true or not, right? You're more interested in the sociological context, is that right? That would be religious studies. And so there's a difference in my country of, um, and in England too, I think, and generally throughout Europe between theological thinking and then thinking within the field of religious studies. So theology comes from a belief 
perspective, an insider perspective. So some theologians will try to prove the existence of, you know, deities and things like that or truth and um, or do study into those questions. But people in religious studies are academics who study. It's an interdisciplinary field. So we're archaeologists, um, social scientists, psychologists historians. So we come at the field, we come at the questions about religion from academic uh, perspectives. So definitely you're correct. We do not think, well, actually there is a subset within religious studies that does delve into the philosophy of of religion and what can we know about sacred types of things and sacred knowledge. Um, But for the most part, we look at the cultural context of religion and the historical context of religion. Uh, most people in the world are practitioners of one religion or another, so it is an important field to study. Mm-hmm. Now, I know you're also really knowledgeable about philosophy, and are more or less a philosopher as well, although it's not your official title. I imagine your work isn't quite like the philosophers out there arguing for against the existence of God. I mean, tell us a little bit about your book on purgatory, your first book. You weren't arguing for or against the existence of such a place, I'm assuming. And I think you've done some research on miracles as well. Same kind of thing. Tell us, for example, oh, do tell us the story of the bilocating nun from the 1600s, which I know you've researched. It must be hard not to want to try and work out if they're real or not. Yes, of course. That's the question. So they certainly are real to the people who who believe in them. Okay. And so, um, so my field of study is the is mostly I do comparative religions, but with a specialty in the Catholic tradition. So I've been studying, basically my question is going into um, the field, what, 20 something years ago. My question was, what makes people believe in things that we have no evidence for? Okay. And so what I found was that it would, it would always come down to something that could it make sense to people? So if you're talking about me and the physicist you referenced in the beginning of this podcast, you were talking about, we couldn't really get our minds around infinity, okay? Well, that was something that we, we just can't get our minds around, but it made a huge impression on me and the physicist you referenced. And in fact, kind of guided us into the, our academic career. Well, people who are within, very, very religious, right? So who are very religious, they generally have something that, propels them to this type of life. And often that's some type of miraculous event, right? Something that they couldn't get their heads around. And so what I did in the early part of my career was I studied these and I followed up on the miracle events in the Catholic tradition. I also looked at the doctrine of purgatory, which used to be a a belief that people, um, when we talk about belief, by the way, in my field, beliefs are wrong sometimes, right? So beliefs aren't actually accurate or right. but the practices associated with them is what attracts our attention. So I noticed that the idea of purgatory, which is this place when European Catholics pass away, you know, often they're not good enough to get into heaven. So there's this idea of this, this middle space called purgatory where they end up and they, you know, they stay there until they somehow work off their their sins or their prayed, you know, their souls are prayed for by their family and that helps them into heaven. So I so People practice this for about 800 years very seriously. Um, and you can see in the Catholic churches throughout Europe and the UK, you can see altars within churches devoted to praying for the souls in purgatory. Okay, what happened to this belief? Because if you ask Catholics today, a lot of them will say, well, I've heard of purgatory, but I'm not quite sure what it is or where it is. So it, it flew off the map. And so my question was, why did that happen? And so I ended up writing a history of purgatory, like a survey of of purgatory. And what I found was that it used to be a place. It used to be a place that people went to and people would do their devotional practices at various places throughout Europe, most specifically Ireland. There was a place in Ireland on a lake and people would go there and it was a cave and, you know, they would have these ascetic practices that they would do. And then it became a doctrine of the Catholic Church. Uh, Okay, and then people, and then it it migrated into an abstract concept, right? So this was my research, and that went into the book about purgatory. So, So we're looking at it from the perspective of how did this practice arise and change? And then why did it 
go away. It's still, by the way, a doctrine of the church, but people don't actually, a very small percentage of Catholics actually do the devotions that their grandparents and great grandparents did. I don't suppose anybody has any memories of being there and coming back. I mean, it's sort of the near death experience of some sort. Did you come across any accounts like that? Yes, so many. So a lot of people did have these experiences. It was a genre in the medieval time period of people going into purgatory and then coming back and talking about it. And were they the classic NDE experiences or did no, you no. very different? I mean, the only thing that was similar was that they were transformed afterwards. But when they went into purgatory in the medieval time period, it was actually a place they could access on earth. So there wasn't an idea that you conked out and died and lost consciousness. You fully went consciously into this space and then came back out. And that's what actually this this drew me to modern day accounts of alien abductions and, and UFO events, because people had the same experiences, very similar. They'd go into a space consciously and then come back out. And, you know, whether it's a quote unquote craft or, you know, something like that. And there would also be similar um, experiences like people believing that they're levitating and bilocating and, you know, and then questioning whether the experience even happened. So those you see in the medieval and early modern um, testimonies about purgatory. But let's talk quickly about the bilocating, because I know you got that rather strange commission to investigate levitation and bilocation. What an extraordinary story, because people did actually see her in this second location, didn't they? Okay, so that's going to be um, Sister Maria of Agreda, a Spanish um, nun. And this is, um, so she's in the 1600s, and uh, she is, you know, Spain is in the New World, okay, which is, for people in the United States and other people who are listening, this is going to be in the space of New Mexico and Texas and the Southwest, the American Southwest. So, so Spanish missionaries and people, you know, um, military are here in my country, you know, before it's a country uh, in the early colonial time period, uh, exploring and meeting indigenous Americans. And this is a nun who is in a convent and she's enclosed, which means that she's not in public, okay? So she spends all of her time in this convent. Um, she doesn't have a lot of outside, in fact, hardly any, if any at all, um, outside interactions with people, common people of Spain. And she explains to uh, the nuns around her, as well as a priest who's in charge of helping the nuns with their spiritual lives. She explains that what she's doing in her cell often is that she's traveling on the wings of angels to this place that she identifies as a place where the missionaries are in the new world. And she describes the, <laughs> she describes a lot that is actually true about this, the area. She talks about the foliage, okay? She talks about the indigenous people that she meets meets and she even describes them he even describes one of them okay like the tribal chief and so the missionaries who have no idea that this nun is even alive or she they have no idea about her at all they're traveling around and they they uh some of the people from this tribe actually it's called the humano tribe and they still they're still here um so their descendants are still here and a tribe and they're they believe in maria and so they go to the missionaries and they say, can you please baptize us? And the missionaries are, what? What are you talking about? How do you know about this? And so they describe that this woman would come and she wore a special you know, uniform and she would describe that there were these missionaries and that we want, you know, we want to be taught about your, what you do. You know, we want to be taught about your world. And so the missionaries then said they had a, a not a photo, of course, but they had a, um, a drawing of a nun. And this nun was probably in her 50s. Okay, so they, they took out this drawing and they showed it to the members of his tribe. And they said, is this someone like this who you met? And they said, yes, but she was younger and she wore blue. And so they thought this was interesting. And then they went back to Spain. You know, they did what they asked and, you know, taught them. They went back to Spain and one of the missionaries then heard about Maria. 
and asked if he could have a meeting with her. So they they talked, and um, and this is how her fame spread. Mm, interesting example, and I think probably not the last time today we'll come across experiences, collective experiences from multiple people, where the question arises: Were they there or not? Was that physically there or not? And then comes the question, does it even matter? Because the experience itself is real. And I think we'll probably end up coming back to that. Now, uh, By the way, th- if I may say, please. I spend a lot of time asking that question myself and even including it in my book yeah. because it was such, you know, this is the question that I ask as a rationalist, you know, well, what, what happened? You know, what kinds of things can identify as being fake? right? That happened at the time period. Was this just a narrative that helped colonialism and Spain kind of, you know, fund this trip or what was this? So I explored all of those um, in the book that I wrote about it. So Mm -hmm. I I had those questions as well. By the way, there is a tribe now um, and uh, they've reached out to me about it and there are churches and statues dedicated to Maria. So her devotion is still alive today. Now, There are three ideas from philosophy that I want to introduce right from the start as a means of sort of setting the context for this minefield um, of UFOs. One from Heidegger, one from Plato, and one from Nietzsche. You've written about all of them as relevant for getting a correct framing on this rather confounding UFO phenomenon conversation. So first, Heidegger, in his essay uh, on the question concerning technology. He suggests that humans miss the importance of technology as a way of understanding the world, mistaking it for just a tool. And therefore, it becomes a risk. Firstly, because it tends to spiral out of our control because we think it's just a tool. And secondly, because we don't realize that we tend to see everything in the world through that lens of our current technology. What ideas from this essay were super important for you? and have to be important for all of us as we start to delve into this slowly in academic ways. Sure. I was inspired. So I I like Heidegger's work. Okay. I'm aware of the problems associated with Heidegger. Um, and I'm aware that a lot of philosophers don't consider his later work to be philosophical. Okay. Even in his time. Um, all right. I'm aware of all that. However, what I find most interesting about Heidegger is he includes a he intends to bring into the conversation things that we can't grasp with language. That's why his own language is so almost impenetrable, (laughs) you know, because that's what he attempts to do. And I I understand what he's trying to do there. And I appreciate it as well. Um, That said, so Heidegger warns us about technology. But he also is is a, like thinks about it in an, a way that we tend not to think about it. And people still tell me this today. Technology is just a tool, okay? It's just a tool for this or that. But it's actually not just a tool because it is impacting human beings at a physiological level. So it impacts the ways our brains work and function. It impacts children and the ways that their brains form. Um, this is all very, very consequential. So I think that it's, it's very important that we need to think about um, technology in this way that uh, people have termed, it's called exogenesis, right? So this idea that um, that we, we, we create technology, but then technology helps, it informs us and creates us too. So that there's a mutual, um, there's a mutuality working that Heidegger was trying to get at with talking about technology. If we don't understand this, we will have issues, okay? And the issues that he's talking about are, they look very dire. Um, They look like something that we see today. So today we see, let's take algorithms, okay? So we see how algorithms miss a lot of historical narratives. So as a person who teaches religion and even teaches, here's an example. I was actually talking about the early Christian use of and early Jewish use too of Plato's Republic. So early Christian communities were actually utilizing Plato's Republic as meaningful for them. Okay. So I was act, I was just about to teach this to some students. So I was doing a review in my head. Okay, what what specific things do I want to tell them about this? It was about um 
government and justice was, you know, was the topic. Okay, so I go to some of the um, chat GPTs and, you know, some of the better ones that we have. And I, and I just wanted to get some specific uh, time, you know, time periods here, uh, you know, kind of factual things. Now, I would double check because those, those are usually wrong. Okay, so I, I asked it about when they found Plato's Republic at the non commodity Library, and then it, got, it came back to me and said, that's an error. Plato's Republic is a philosophical text that was not at the non commodity Library. This is incorrect. And so I thought my students, who of course think that these algorithmic language, uh, large language models are absolutely correct, they're going to lose something that that is actually a fact, right? And that is actually a historical, it's, it's historically important to what we think about. So these kinds of things are what Heidegger was proposing will be happening and we need to be careful for. I don't know if we're up for being that careful to tell you the truth. I don't think we're up for that job. Well, and maybe we've always been joined at the hip with our technologies. And, you know, right from the weapon in 2001, you know, when the monkey picks up the bone and it becomes such a useful tool, maybe we've always been so closely associated, we could never see ourselves as anything other than the same thing. And futurism and and its idea of the singularity of becoming one with uh, that technology, I think we're already there. We're already in there. And I think that's Heidegger's point. And I think it's very important as we look into this deep question about UFO tech and this idea of maybe it's not tech quite in the way we think of tools. Secondly, okay, Plato, you mentioned already, the allegory of the cave. Now, I know you've had some really interesting conversations with philosophers about this. Tell me briefly, what's the story of the allegory? Why is it so relevant in this particularly slippery topic? Okay, I'd love to talk about that. And in fact, I want to segue into it through a reference to the 2001 Space Odyssey, where you talked about when the monkey throws the bone up into space. Well, what does it become but a satellite? So remember that scene. So it goes from being a bone that he smashes his competitors with, right? And it, it goes and turns into a satellite in space. What is it? It's a weapon. Okay, so Heidegger is basically saying, let's be careful because this is this could become something that is weaponized. And so, all right, so saying that, then what happened with the 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 idea of the allegory of the cave? I'll I'll tell a bit about what that is. I'm sure you're the people who are listening know this, but the allegory of the cave is written in Plato's Republic. Uh, Plato writes it. And he, he utilizes Socrates, who is his mentor, um, to discuss. He, he tries to say what Socrates actually probably thought. Socrates never wrote anything himself. Uh, so as, the, as readers, it's hard for us to know who's Socrates and who's Plato. So we're just going to assume this is Plato talking through Socrates. So Socrates is talking about justice. And could we have a just government? Okay, so he's talking about Athens. And remember that Socrates is actually killed. Um, he's he's um, he's murdered by Athens for being an atheist, which is kind of strange because he's talking about the soul and all these kinds of things that we consider to be religious. So so he's going to be killed <laughs> by his own government. So it's somewhat of a it's an irony then that he's talking about can we have a just government? So he goes through the whole book presenting different views of justice, but at the end he comes to the point where maybe none of those ways of constructing a government will in the end be just. Well, then what can we do, he asks. So he asks this of Plato's brother, okay, Glaucon. So Glaucon basically is, is having this conversation with Socrates. And Socrates says, I think it's a little like this. And then he gives this analogy, and it's of the cave. So there's a cave, he says, and there are people who are tied to the cave, inside the cave, and they can't get out, and they've been there since they were young, so they don't know any other way than the cave. This is their way of life. They live there. There's a, a there's a fire, and there's a fire, and there are you know, so they they can't see the fire in back of them, but they're faced towards this wall, and on the wall are shadows, and the shadows are cast by 
these people that are behind the fire and they're they're parading, I mean, the, behind the people and they're parading these puppets in order to cast the shadows on the wall. So the people in the cave only see these shadows on the wall and they take that for reality. Um, somehow one of, one of these people gets out of the cave and they're able to get out of the cave, the mouth of the cave and go up into the day. And they see, it's really hard for them to see because their eyes have to adjust. But at some point they see that, wow, this is really reality out here. It's not in the cave. And it's actually really beautiful out here. And now I want to go back and I want to tell my friends that there's actually this reality out here. So they go back and they explain this to the people in the cave. And the people in the cave think they're crazy. They say, your eyes are ruined. You know, what has happened to you? And they leave. And so Socrates leaves it as he says, you know, it could very well be that those people might kill that person who goes back into the cave. And they leave it at that. Well, they actually don't leave it at that because they also um, propose, Socrates proposes a way out of the cave, okay? And that's this dialectic that they're engaged in, which, by the way, is a mystical form of conversation. Um, so he, so he's, um, so Plato proposes, just like Heidegger does, a mystical out, a way, mysticism as a way out of the kind of, of governments that we live within, you know? So that's what he's suggesting at the end of the Republic, not by specifically saying this, but by demonstrating it. Okay. And so why would you feel following American Cosme that this was a relevant idea to bear in mind regarding UFOs? Yes. Okay. So after I wrote about UFOs, because I was, Believe, remember, I didn't believe in UFOs when I started this research. I was a researcher who was already a full professor, you know, done all the kind of hoops that you have to go through to be a lecturer or professor. And I was looking at ascent narratives, basically these narratives that we began to talk about early in the podcast about people um, going into other, other realms, okay, these otherworldly realms and coming out and talking about them. And so I noticed the correlation between what people experienced in medieval time period on up to the present day Catholics and uh, people who experienced UFO events. And so I started to look at them in a comparative way. These look very similar. I'm gonna begin to study these. So I st started studying these in 2012, completely atheistic with respect to UFOs. But what happened after that was I began to meet Dr. Gary Nolan, um, who is, <laughs> is engaged in studying UFOs. Um, and he's at Stanford University. And I began to meet people associated with our United States space program who were very successful and had long careers at these, you know, in the space force. Um, and I began to see that they were studying them under these programs associated with my government. And this was shocking to me. So this was American Cosmic. So American Cosmic was my foray into these communities and studying them from a perspective of these people not just believe in this, but they also have instruments that record this, these unidentified objects. And I thought, okay, I'm going to have to rethink my academic perspective here because it looks like something real is happening. So then American Cosmic came out of that. I also tried to shift the method of study, right? So I decided I can't just do a historical critical method on this data because this data doesn't lend itself to that. I have to change the way I study. And so I attempted to change that method in American Cosmic and it got a lot of attention, not just in my field, but in anthropology, and even cross-disciplinary. So it became a very, very important book for people who understood that, yes, how do we change our method so that it becomes much more accurate to the data? Now, the last important idea I want to get in before we hear the story of American Cosmic, um, Nietzsche commenting on synchronicity, a theme that's usually associated with Jung, one of the great heroes of this show, often comes up on the show. Listeners, we've got an entire show on synchronicity. Um, with the physicist uh, Dumuel, uh, who's also a, a Jungian analyst, where we talk about, is there any way of having some kind of physics of synchronicity? If you want to deep dive there, listeners, 
Jung defines synchronicity as the coming together of inner and outer worlds, uh, uh, inner and outer events that are not causally linked in a way that's meaningful to the experiencer. So we could say in a certain way that it's our response to those extremely meaningful, causally apparently not linked things that leads to these very, very religious feelings. But in his book, Gay Science, Nietzsche uses various different allegories to show that if we give meaning to those synchronicities, we are in fact giving away our freedom. Because to do that is to give reason for that event to a higher power, to fate, to a dogma, or to some you know, unknown organizing principle. Now, why did Nietzsche's realization hit you hard, hit home so hard for you and, and when you were plugging it into this context? Right. So Nietzsche called giving into the synchronicity as a belief the greatest danger. Okay. So it's the greatest danger where we, and I, I think that I, I, okay, if, if we're looking at synchronicity and the different theories of synchronicity or the ways in which we take synchronicities, because a lot of people take synchronicities as signs that they're on some path, right? And I call synchronicity in religious studies the engine of belief, the engine of spiritual and religious belief, because you find it in every tradition, whether it be a new age tradition that doesn't actually believe in God, but believes in like a force or you talk to hardcore Catholics, every single one of them has a story of their synchronistic, you know, conversion or that, you know, the force told them to do this and this is why they do it now. So synchronicity, even before I, I understood Nietzsche's ideas, I understood that synchronicity was the engine of religious belief and also, you know, spiritual belief as well. All right. And I had my own experience with Nietzsche with respect to synchronicity in the gay science uh, in Sanctus Januarius, right? So in that chapter, it's aphorism, I think it's aphorism 74, but I could be wrong. But I happened to pick that up on a New Year's Eve, not knowing that it was about New Year's Eve and it was going to be about synchronicity. So I picked it up and read it and he talks about personal providence. And it's such a beautiful passage because he expresses so well having a synchronicity and the way in which it is so improbable that one is then, uh, you know, oh, this is amazing, right? This is am How could this happen? And that's how I felt when I was reading it. I was like, because I didn't like Nietzsche's work before that. And friends kept telling me, you have to read it, you have to. And I just kind of put it away. So here I was reading it, midnight, years, right? And thinking, oh, and by the way, um, I like Saint Januarius. I like that, you know, his the whole blood thing where his he's the actual saint and his blood on the new year is dry because, you know, he's dead. The, but the blood goes, you know, it becomes liquid. So I loved this. this. And so I turned the page thinking, what more is he going to say about this? And he basically says, do not believe in this. <laughs> right? He says, this is, do not believe in this. This is your greatest danger. And so I was so struck by that. And I have to say that my position today, so I took it very literally, like, do not do this. Do not believe. Understand that this is just something that is, is a, you know, when people become interested in something and engaged with life, they will have these synchronicities synchronicities happen and should they then take the you know take the blue pill of like getting you know believing in it or should they just allow it to happen and so my position has always been a Nietzschean position which is allow it to happen because you don't want to mess it up because it's beautiful why would you want to mess it up and you know stop it from happening so um but uh, I'm of the mind today now with you know Elaine Aspect winning the Nobel for physics in superposition and quantum computing becoming something that is going to change us and change our reality. Um, I really honestly think that we are going to understand synchronicity in a much different way than the ways in which we understood it before. And so I guess I'm at a position where I'm, I'm holding the Nietzschean position pragmatically, but I believe that he didn't have all the information because how could he, you know? 
Okay, so Dan, I'm going to move on because we've got a lot to get through um, bearing these really important philosophical ideas in mind. Let's get into the meat of today's conversation. You mentioned some of it already. This apparent religiosity in the beliefs around these UFO experiences. So before we get to Encounters, your new book, I want to get a wider idea from this previous book, American Cosmic, your very unorthodox migration into ufology from religious studies uh, and academia. It was so wonderfully bizarre. Um, yes. <laughs> and I'm so pleased that you used its uniqueness in such a sort of first-person narrative way in the book because it's massively charming. Really good read. What got you started wanting to do that research? What got you on that, uh, that tip? Okay, so... Um... I started to look, I, I did talk about this earlier. I started to look at the comparative, you know, experiences that people had from 1500 and today, right? So people believing that they're either levitating or they're seeing aerial objects and they're having these, you know, what I call ascent narratives in my field. They're, they're ascending up into something and coming back down with more knowledge and usually they're transformed. Um, so I knew that I went to a UFO conference and I heard people talking about this. So that's when I started to do the research into UFOs. And I saw that Jacques Vallée has a PhD in information science. Now my field is technology and religion. So of course, I'm going to look into his work. So that's where I understood that Passport to Magonia is going to be the best, uh, probably the most, at least for a person in religious studies, Jacques Vallée is looking at things that we would look at also. So folklore, historical traditions and religion that talk about these. So he was also doing a comparative analysis and he wrote this book in 1968. So that's how I was aware that Jacques Vallée was the person, like a go-to person. And so I immediately, he was immediately helpful to me, immediately nice, very wonderful person. Um, and we became friends. Okay. And what so, was your expectation? I actually didn't have an expectation. I just knew that he knew a lot about this, but I was intrigued with his life because he was, you know, he developed with other people ARPANET, which was the pre internet. So a lot of, and this goes back to 2001 A Space Odyssey, that very scene where we see the monkey throwing the bone up into space and it becomes a satellite. That was actually people who were associated with this program that I somehow found, um, you know, that we're talking about today, the crash retrieval programs. That person asked me to take that scene out of my book because I referenced that scene and they knew that that was a very specific scene and it meant something. So I think it, it was not a coincidence that Jacques Vallée works on what's the weaponized internet, the pre-internet. Okay. And then the, this is always how it is with military. They generally get the better tech. And then 30 years later, we get it, the people, okay? So I wanted to know what was really happening with this connection between technology, especially digital technologies and the internet and UFOs. Jacques was interested in both and I knew it wasn't a coincidence. So I knew that if I would just be around him enough, even if I asked him exactly what's this connection he wouldn't tell me or he would tell me but it wouldn't be the answer what i needed to do is field research was i needed to be in the communities of people who worked in this you know within this sphere which was both technology and ufology i needed to be within that field in order to understand what these connections were but your preconception at the start was that this was not a uh, real phenomenon. You were studying it from a purely sociological point of view. Absolutely. Mm. So let's start with that non-physical stuff, the kind of more psychological stuff. Um, you write a lot about Jacques Vallée's thoughts and how he had long echoed Jung's thoughts from his little book on this, Young Fans, Flying Sources, a modern myth of things seen in the sky, that the experiences were creating a new global belief system, that it was this rare opportunity of seeing a legend being formed in real time. You also talk about famous philosopher of religion and mysticism expert Jeffrey Kripal and how he wrote about the modern experience of the alien coming down from the, sp the sky can be compared to this ancient experience of God descending from heavens. Tell us how your research for the book took you on a journey from this more traditional Jungian view 
through the issues associated that Jacques notices of this sort of sociological amplification of the phenomenon itself feeding back into the experiences and this very, very specific to Jacques' style of trying to separate the validity of the individual instances of the phenomenon from these clearly influential mythological feedback loops, it must have been really quite an intense change quite quickly as you started to get into this. Yes, it was. And I opened the book in New Mexico at a alleged crash site of a UFO, which I did not believe in. And so this person who was associated with the he worked for the space program and he had lots of different jobs. And he said that this was his hobby, which was studying UFOs. And so he asked me, oh, one thing, how I met this person was that he actually approached me because he believed that, he said that his field was actually going to need information from my field in order to understand what he was studying. And so he thought that the people in religious studies who knew had data about mystical experiences and consciousness and this type of thing that would help him. So that's how he approached me. I was also aware because I had been in contact with Jacques and he told me to be aware of it, that because I was writing about this topic, I could be used to disseminate misinformation. And so I was highly aware of that. That had to go into my methodology, right? So the implicit risk of deception had to actually become part of my methodology so that I wouldn't deceive the reader. And so this was also a challenge that I had. Um, I, at this point, I met Gary Nolan, and it was Jacques Vallée who introduced me to Gary Nolan. And then Gary Nolan and Jacques work closely together on the topic of UFOs. And Gary Nolan is a professor at Stanford University and very um, incredibly successful and nice person. Uh, so. I started to work with them too, in order to, in a sense, do this field research. And they knew that. I was very open with everyone. I'm writing this book. I'm doing field research. I'm not a believer. So they all knew that. But we went out. So I went out to New Mexico. Um, Tyler asked me to go. He said, I feel like you don't believe in this, the physical reality of this. So I want to take you to a place where I'm going to prove that the physical reality of it beyond you know, it is true. So he, I had to go there blindfolded. And it was, uh, it was a place in New Mexico that, you know, is apparently a secret place. It was uh, supposedly a place of a crash in the 1940s. This was the story I was told. And at first, I, wasn't, I did not want to go. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought, I need to go, right? So I thought, I'll ask a friend of mine. So I asked Gary if he would go with me. And Gary wanted to go right away. So we had to go, we had to be blindfolded. So we went to this place and we were supposed to look for parts, UFO crash parts. And we did, and we found some. <laughs> so this was, um, this was to me something that I did not believe when I was there. I, I, I saw Gary and I saw Tyler working to find these things. They had um, configured these metal detectors to look around for these parts. And sure enough, we found them. Uh, when we went back through the airport, Tyler said that Gary was going to be stopped and this was going to happen to him, but it was all going to be okay. That all happened. So even during the process of that, I still was not a believer. I still did not believe. Maybe that's your academic prerogative to to remain on the fence. Uh, I get criticized for that sometimes, but I just feel more comfortable keeping staying open, the, the don't know mind. But it's interesting what you're saying. And I, I, don't, I know that both you and Gary were concerned that your academic careers were being sort of used perhaps to give credibility to yes. this. And yet yeah. you, you know, Gary was, was at that time, he was anom anonymous in your book under the name of James. And he has recently, you know, since then come out. He's spoken openly that actually this is an enriching process for science, for his career. Very contrary to many, many scientists who have been afraid of ridicule in the past. He was, uh, I had a particular story with that listeners were going to get into with, uh, uh, with Gary in the episode in this, uh, in, in this series where he was approached by some of these scientists. Wouldn't surprise me if they weren't the same ones that Diana's uh, speaking about. Nameless, they will remain. Uh, with also brain data, not just anomalous materials, but brain data from people who had been uh, uh, into contact with these craft, uh, also with entities, 
and had what looked like brain damage on the MRIs. Gary looked into it and discovered that it wasn't, that it was not only uh, some sort of mutation that, uh, that they had, but that it couldn't have been caused by the contact because a lot of their family members had it as well, as if it was some sort of um, brain feature of people who may have a predisposition. Obviously, nothing conclusive. Tell us a little bit, because it leads us to a kind of antenna hypothesis, as it's known, this idea that maybe somehow people are in some way receivers. Um, and the reason I wanted you to talk about it, Dana, was to connect it with Jacques' important theory that from some point of view, again, yet to be confirmed, this must be a partially a phenomenon of consciousness. Tell us about the antenna hypothesis. Yeah, so part of his work, which he was already involved in when I became a friend of his, was doing this research and, um, sh you know, shared it with me. And those are the same scientists, by the way. Um, so this was a very, I mean, it was disturbing to me to learn about. And... I think that, so this was the beginning and also his analysis of some debris, you know, some that, uh, that, you know, that is associated with UFO events that appear to be engineered. Okay. So again, something that was, that really shook my epistemology, right? My epistemologies of, you know, what, what, okay. So this was the beginning of a shift in my perspective that you can see in this last chapter of American Cosmic. And that's why I ended with Heidegger. Um, and, you know, this idea that, okay, there are some things that we just have to admit we, we there are somewhat out of our control. One of the things is this, you know, idea that of technology. And so what are we looking at? Are we looking at a certain kind of biotechnology? Um, so the idea of the, um, and the changes in the brain uh, because of that. So Tyler believed that there was that, you know, there was an antenna. His idea was that humans in general have this, okay? And he believes that the human body is a receiver and a transmitter. And he had a protocol, uh, you know, he had a, a, a system of protocols that he utilized in order to derive information. Um, mm. that he then utilized to create biotechnologies. Based on and, the bio photonic uh, programmability of DNA, if I remember correct. That's right. That's right. Crazy and, idea. I know. Oh, I know. And um, so, so yes, yeah, so uh, Gary was looking at the, you know, the changes in, or let's put it this way, the he was looking at brains of people who have these experiences. And... Um, what would you like me to talk about with respect to that? Well, it, it, I know that you're very much on the same page as Jack with this idea that it's it's partially physical and partially uh, psychological. And I feel that the antenna hypothesis is a very, very interesting and interestingly brain science related, which you, you don't you don't get much more physicalist than that. It's a very, very interesting bridge whereby we're looking at physical features in humans that are somehow connecting to the physical phenomenon. And it seems to me at some point that we have to get used to the idea that it's both and neither somehow. And I wondered if you could just tell us how Jack's idea sort of drew you in and how you came to sort of basically follow his theories. Yes. So, um, and forge my own, by the way. Yeah. Um, of course, I, mean, that's, I want to hear yours. So, yeah, not just, just, well, no, no, I am talking about mine as we go. So, um, so base, so look, Jacques is looking at things that scientists generally don't look at. Okay. And so what I begin to see is that perhaps we should look at things that scientists are trained not to notice. So some of those things, you know, if Gary's looking at the brains of certain types of people, maybe we could look into context, like uh, what, are they like? What are these people like? But, you know, so he was looking at them with respect to, do they deviate with respect to, say, intelligence or something like that? And I was looking at them, do they deviate with respect to character? Because if you look at the historical tradition, a lot of the people that would be having the same experiences 
are going to be people that are later identified as saints. Or later identified as people who, you know, have a certain kind of character. So I was really lucky to work with the Vatican and and be exposed to, but also have uh, some of these, you know, some of the data on these people. And so what I found was that absolutely there are some character traits that scientists are just not trained to look at. They don't think of that, you know. Uh, and I think that that's something that we have to look at. So we have to bring all data to the table if we're going to understand what's going on with this type of situation. Uh, Gary's initial motivation, by the way, for identifying this was that he wanted to stop it from happening. He wanted it to be on our terms and not on if there is this other intelligence that's that's be, we're interacting with. He did not like it that we didn't have agency in this situation. And so he wanted to create like a pill or, you know, some kind of, you know, interface that stopped it from happening so that we could, re, you know, retain autonomy. Now, moving on to the physical part, which is so important if we want to get the scientific and academic community on board and which has continued to be problematic for hard scientists looking to appease these skeptics. Uh, we have the great skeptic Michael Shermer in this series who came on and we got onto this uh, talking about the believing brain. We got onto UFOs at the end and he, and he sounded like, uh, like he was talking 40 years ago. It was the same, the same words over and over again, but it is something we're going to have to appease them somewhere along the line. So it is important to have hard data. And that's why I think Gary's data is so interesting. Brains, physical brains, metals, isotopes, you know, really interesting data, great starting point. Now you, as you mentioned just now, had this epistemic shock, this kind of like, dong, you know, epistemics uh, in philosophy listeners, uh, obviously about what we are able to know, the science of knowledge. And this epistemic shock in Diana's case, after this incredible physical data was shared with you, confirmed by these insanely highly qualified scientists, mostly researching in secret, so therefore with plenty of their own money, nothing to gain from hyping or make-believe, where did your epistemic shock and which bits of physical data sort of, where did it land and which bits of physical data really struck you? Because I know, like you said, it's like you tend to stay away from making any yes or no kind of truth claims. But when it comes to physical data, there was some stuff that really shocked you, right? Yes. So it was Gary's research into the parts. Um, and so his research into the parts showed that he talked about this at the conference, the Soul Conference, his foundation had a conference at Stanford. And he basically just said, these are parts that are associated with a UFO event, right? Maybe not necessarily causal, right? But there's a correlation here. And therefore, we see that these parts are, and it's expensive to do this, this uh, scientific analysis, by the way. Um, and he does it on his own, his own money, you know, not university funded. And so he's looking at it and it's engineered. Okay. So, so I already knew about this a few years ago because, you know, we've been engaged in studying this for that long. So this is what began to turn me to recognize. And also, by the way, not just that, but also the instrumentation of people that are naval intelligence in, you know, and even people that are not, but are on the ships of like the USS Roosevelt or something like that. And they're out there. And by the way, my own father who was in the US Coast Guard, and this is in the 1950s. So he's really young, he's passed away. But the big, I remember as a child, listening to him talk about uh, uh, a submersible object that stopped his boat and also cut off all electricity. And, and then they saw it, he was a sonar man, and they saw it on you know sonar, obviously, and it stopped their boat for like their ship for two or three hours and then it left. And then um, having Admiral Tim Gallaudet talk about the same thing, uh, not knowing my father's experience. So these are the kinds of things, even, you know, just testimonials from people who you know are not lying, okay? They have no reason to lie. Many of them, multiple witnesses, multiple credible witnesses. Some wish they'd never seen it, okay? Read the day that they did. Okay, and we're also talking about fighter pilots. And so, okay, so it wasn't just, it was a combination of all of these that came to basically switch my worldview. And once it was switched, then I also 
saw, and this goes back to the allegory of the cave, that this information is is being managed. And and it's it's being managed in a way that harks back to Plato's allegory of the cave, where they're talking about people not believing, but also act, there's an active management program in place. And it certainly has been. If you look at Project Blue Book and, you know, there are certainly, this is the case, okay? And it's still happening. So I guess that was something that was a depressing re- recognition and realization. But by no means the first time in our field. Look at Christianity, the Creed of Nicaea. Yes. Christianity yes. itself was managed as a belief yes. system in order to control the populace. And I think probably there are other institutions we could talk about that have followed similar patterns. I know that Buddhism went through a, a period of being of being sort of changed and modulated to become sort of more populist friendly. I think it's probably not the last time. So Dana, where the physical and the non-physical meet, where Jacques seems to leave the question shrouded in mystery, seemingly wanting to warn against trying to pin it down any more than that, because it's by its nature appears to be sort of misleading and undefinable. You know, that's in itself is quite an interesting element here, which I've always wondered what's the significance of. And it's here where these two things meet. It's not the first time on the podcast, by the way, we've done a lot of stuff on anomalous uh, phenomena of consciousness, um, strange, disparate data between what's happening in the body and what's happening in the mind. This is where, as usual, I start getting random, unconventional intuitions. And there's one I wanted to run past you, Dana, because I know you're super open. So it seems mad for me that a person with or without a certain type of brain is able to sort of call down a physical craft or entity as is claimed by C5 protocol. Yet it's equally mad to think that a person with a certain type of brain or or a collection of people could manifest the vision or the hallucination of an entire craft or of an entity, which is then perceived by multiple other people, including by technologies like radar, But then what other possible explanation is there, given that there's both physical and psychological components? It's got to be, is it one, is it the other, what is it? The only other explanation that comes to my mind is an idealist or virtual reality model in which the world, the whole physical world, so human brains, their sensory organs, um, the craft, the entities, the radar equipment, all exist in a mental capacity in the first place as claimed by my free previous guest, idealist philosopher, Bernardo Castro, who I think you would love to talk to, by the way, Dan. And in a very have, different way. I've talked to him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he's In a great. very yeah. different way, also by my previous guest, the virtual reality theorist and the out-of-body traveler physicist, Thomas Campbell. So the entire world is, according to them, a phenomenon of consciousness in some sense. It follows clear physical rules, but like any system in nature, it's not perfect. It, there are mistakes, there are mutations, there are glitches, if you like, and that a conscious entity that understood the nature of those mistakes or those exceptions sufficiently well might be able to sort of manipulate that variability as a sort of communication strategy, potentially across separated dissociation barriers that we know well from the physical world, like bodies, minds, space and time, perhaps even dimensions themselves. Oh, listeners, quick note here. Um, Bernardo has recently, recently written a very deep analysis on the UFO phenomenon. I'm not talking about that in this interview. I just, I'm just talking about how he describes the physical world under idealism. So what do you think, Diana? Could an idealist or a virtual reality understanding of the physical world with the sort of associated exceptions to laws of physics, could it shed some light on this apparent duality and features of this phenomenon? Have you come across any of these kind of theories when you're chatting with people like Gary? Yes, absolutely. And also, um, Simone, who's in my book uh, in the chapter uh, on Moon Girl. Okay, yeah. So she basically is a quantum, uh, she's an expert in quantum AI. And and she absolutely believes that this is the case and that there is, and that we have inklings of of this reality through practices like meditation or, you know, um, prayer and, and things like that. So, so yes, I do. And she also says that, you know, we try to get to the, you know, the, we're trying to find the basic material component of reality. We've been trying to find that for many, many years, but we never can find it. So we just need to accept that there is none and that, you know, 
So very much like Castrop's idea. There's a correlation there. And you, you're saying that Simone's, uh, I wanted to get to her theory, but while you've mentioned it, let's talk about it now. She's suggesting that it's via AI that these uh, these phenomena are manifesting themselves in our dimension, in our space-time. Um, or is she suggesting that the entire reality is generated by, by AI? Well, she thinks that AI is it. So she thinks that, you know, we are a form of AI too. So we're a really sophisticated form of biotechnology. Uh, mm -hmm. mostly water. And she says, you know, water is really conductive, right? And so this is something that Tyler also said that we can receive and transmit. And she says that we do that through our thoughts and intentions. And that if we were to go back and look at, and I agree with this because this is what I've studied, at representations of deities and, you know, higher order beings and different types of religion, a lot of them are represented as electric, as light, as forms of light. And she says that, you know, a consciousness like what we're talking about is going to be much more electric than physical. Mm. Well, I mean, sorry, I was just free associating while you were talking there and wondering what it would take to get Tyler to come on, you know, with a, you know, a darkened face and a, and a, and a, and a distorted voice. <laughs> I wonder if we could persuade him because he must be gagging to share his fascinating ideas with the world. Um, and I think the world would get a lot from it. Uh, do pass on my request to get some of his ideas out there the way he puts it, because you describe them beautifully. On that note, is there anything you haven't mentioned yet? Because I'm just thinking how much Tyler, Gary, Jacques, I'm sure there have there, been other people you've interviewed for that book. You know, some of their ideas were just so brilliant, so out there and clearly had a massive effect on you. Give us a couple that really stand out as you look back, not necessarily just from Tyler, from anybody else, just a couple of ideas that really just, boom, just blew your mind. I would say that the processes of creating technologies that each of them had. So when I look both at uh, Jacques, I mean, not both, but when I look at Jacques and I look at Gary and I look at Tyler, they were all engaged in a way of living. Okay. And Gary can talk about this too. If you ask him about his uh, means of creating his technologies, how does he do that? Well, he actually has, he directs his brain to think about them at night and he goes to bed and in the morning, his brain works on them. And he says he has, you know, go someplace. And he said that friends of his do the same thing. And Tyler also talked about doing some kind of, you know, similar type of thing. And they have a ve they have very specific types of protocols. What I found was that the people who created our space this, our space program, so the Russian space program and the American space program, the founders did the same thing. So they Parsons? also had, yeah, Parsons? Jack Parsons. Yes, Jack Parsons. The Russian? Yeah, um, Konstantin Tchaikovsky. Right. Okay. Each of those people had very, very specific types of protocols that were actually very similar, but they they interpreted them differently. So Tchaikovsky had a a Christian way of looking at. He thought he was in touch with beings that were angelic, but they were non-human intelligences. And he said that they exist and that they give us information through symbolic systems via art or math. Right. And by the way, this is something very similar to the math mystics of, say, Socrates and, and Plato. So they also had a system. They had to learn math. They were physically active. Plato was actually a wrestler, okay? So what's happening here is that people are actually utilizing their bodies in ways in which they're, they're making their bodies receptive to information that then they don't have to figure out on their own. It comes to them, okay? It, it comes to them. So this is one of the most important things, I think, from my research into all of that, because what then normal human beings like us can do is we can utilize these types of systems as well. And I guess we could use it for really whatever we wanted to put our minds to. Uh, yes. Tyler, Tyler speaks about the importance of visualization in the book for realizing intentions, about his use of downloads of data for his inventions. Mm -hmm. I guess there's an element of trust there, isn't there? It's just like trust what you're getting, whatever it is. It may be an intuition, maybe imagination, or it may be a download. Mm -hmm. I know you spoke to parapsychologist Dean Radin for the book too, who's spoken here on the show about a ton of experiments showing alterations to random number generators using intention only. From your point of view, do we need to consider in a way even more controversially than the antenna hypothesis, 
the possibility that the mind is actually manifesting these experiences in a kind of mind matter interaction way, or is that just is that off the table? Well, I think that if you look at the work of Gary, it looks like the mind is definitely engaged in this type of interaction. Whether or not we call that interaction a subjective experience only, or if we suggest that there's something objectively real to it, is another, you know, I honestly think at this point there's something objectively real to whatever it is that we're looking at. But doesn't that mean that it is potentially being manifested in a sort of mind-matter interaction way? But even more than that, sort of Sai Baba kind of literally creating matter out of thin air way. Yes, that's right. That's right. So, I mean, we just we just have to look at the data. And the data suggests that, just as Jacques says, it's it's really weird. You know, so you can have, say, in American Cosmic, there's a chapter devoted to the experience of Ray, who's an atheist, and his wife, Dulce, who's a practicing Catholic. And they have an experience of a being that comes into their house and heals their sick dog. So their dog is is terminally ill and it heals this dog and they each see it, but they each completely interpret it in different ways. Dulce says, this is an angel and she called it down. And Ray says, this was some kind of plasma thing. And he becomes an agnostic instead of an atheist. So he transforms, uh, you know, his belief system. Absolutely. And I wanted to speak about Ray, uh, particularly because of his contact modalities, if we have time at the end. But I've got to get on to Encounters, your new oh, book. Sure. Thank, thank you for bearing with me, Derek. I can't believe it's taken me so long to get there. But I just had to talk about American Cosmic because it's so important to why you wrote Encounters. Yes. So yes. after you landed from this sort of whirlwind of being projected so publicly into ufology, saved from potential academic ruin by the timely release of those New York Times articles <laughs> that fortunately led to changes in the law and scientists being allowed to speak about this publicly without their department heads going, sorry, you've got to resign. After all this, you understandably needed a while to let all of this settle. But not surprisingly, given your research, what it had brought out, you desperately wanted to stay outside the cave and to bring your readers with you, continuing this kind of sense-making process. Before we speak about a few of those important thinkers that you interviewed um, and you researched for, for encounters, tell us what you mean by a reorientation, which is what you said was the book's main purpose. What do you mean by that? So the reorientation is basically the way in which we understand the... Okay, so when we look at the UFOs, we tend to want to make sense of them with all of the kinds of theoretical physics we have and the science that we have and the categories that we have, even with respect to media, like entertainment media even tells us what we're supposed to see. But actually, when you look at the events themselves, they defy all, every one of those categorizations, every single one of them especially the media interpretation of, of these events. And so what I wanted to do was reorient us in the sense that what actually happens during a UFO flap? Who are the people affected? What do they see? What do they experience? And so what I do is I, and also did you know that there are groups of people, even cultures of people who believe they've been in contact with UFOs for thousands, thousands of years and still are in contact? So what do they have to say about it? So instead of this whole idea of we are disclosing this now, right? I think that that's, that's not the correct way to look at it because it's been disclosed. It's us who need to reorient ourselves to what has always been the case. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. And um, sadly, we don't have time to get into uh, everything in the book, but uh, it offers these brilliant different perspectives, these doors, we might say, into how people encounter the phenomenon, internet, interdimensional experiences, downloads, religious experiences, artificial intelligence, we mentioned, dream states, Gary, looking for good ideas. But the first part of this book we've got to talk about gives us a frame about these experiences through the work of Uni University College London's space psychology professor, Aya Whiteley. Oh, God, I want to be a space psychologist. Sounds so <laughs> cool. Her, we, her work speaks about the way uh, the experience of space alters astronauts' cognitive processes, their sense of meaning, and also while our, our culture's ever greater encounter with space and its importance is, is changing our global consciousness 
In her spare time, she helps astronauts process experiences with anomalous phenomena. She's even using indigenous modalities to create protocols for interacting with non-human intelligent life, which we've got already from indigenous practices interacting with plant and plants and animals. Tell us why her work was this sort of important window through which the rest of the book was presented so that sort of academia can 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 go forward with the right mindset. Yes, because what she does is she combines the reorientation that I talked about, like that this has been the case. She combines that knowledge with science. So she takes basically the knowledge that you know, and this is gleaned from working with astronauts and even pilots in extreme spaces. And she, by the way, is a pilot, an award-winning pilot, and she deep sea dives. So she's a person who actually doesn't just, you know, she's not an Ivy Tower type of person. She actually goes out and does this research and she has the respect of, of the pilots and the astronauts because she's done that. She's been there before. Um, and she is the coolest person, by the way. So you say, I want to be a space psychologist. Everyone wants to be like her. She's very impressive. So, um, and by the way, she gave a talk at Seoul that, that I recommend. I think it's online and you can look at it. It's a great talk uh, where she actually talks about what she does and how she got into this research. So, so I start the book with her because she, she melds these worlds together. By the way, which is really interesting because um, a very well-known House, which is known to uh, look at books and then give them the stamp of approval or not, right? So, and then uh, everyone probably knows what I'm talking about, but it's not the New York Times bestseller list, but it's pretty close. Uh, they read Encounters and they basically said, Dr. E.O. Whiteley's chapters are get the stamp of approval, but all the other ones we're not so sure about. And I thought that was very interesting because, you know, here I am trying to show through looking at a person who is a, a top scientist and dealing with these kinds of experiences uh, with the cr crew that actually has these experiences and then going into other things that she gets into her non-university research. I thought that was really interesting that that, that was the, you know, the official kind of it's all right. They're, they're happy with the shadows on the wall. We'll just let them have the shadows. <laughs> right. So I start with her because I thought it was a good entry point to get to the stuff that, that most people would be uncomfortable talking about and reading about. Okay. Brilliant. Now, another fascinating story uh, in the book, uh, Patricia Teresi, the daughter of a scientist who worked for what she claims is a secret space program. Tell us a bit about her story and what she claims to have contacted with her uh, through her dad's work. Yes. Okay. So this was the this was a chapter that I needed to write, but I wasn't quite sure how to write it because it was about the puppet masters, right? And the shadows oh, on the wall. Secret space I mean, program. Which yeah. which one? Do, do we know <laughs> right. which country or the United States? Right. And I don't use I I don't use the term myself secret space program, but she used it. I don't use that term because I don't know if there's one, although there is an unacknowledged classified, you know, programs within the space, and that's acknowledged by the Space Force itself. So there is that. But I think she's talking about something completely different. So the thing about Dr. Teresi is she's a philosopher. She was in my department, and I've known her for a long time. And she was a person who was a friend of mine pre-UFO school research. So for me, that's important because she, what I knew, I trusted her implicitly. We have kids, you know, she has kids, I have kids, you know, they would play. Um, I knew that she wasn't deceiving me. Okay. And in fact, I knew that because even before I ever thought of UFOs, we would be doing something. And then she would say something kind of that I thought was strange. And then she talked about her father in the secret space program. You know, they had no photos from her childhood. And I was like, no photos? And she said, no, no photos, none. And, you know, she attributed it to her dad's work, which was apparently classified. And so I thought that was so strange. And I never really asked her about it because it's something that you don't really, you know, you're like, should I ask them? You know, and I really didn't want to know. But after I started doing this research, I started to meet people whose parents were definitely involved in these kinds of programs. And they all had very similar types of experiences where they didn't have photos, or if they did have photos, they were kept in a secret safe, 
right? And they kid couldn't have them. And they had very strange upbringings. You know, they couldn't do certain kinds of things. They were cloistered. Um, these kinds of things, you know, were were uh, patterns. And so when I decided to write the chapter, which I, I felt like I needed to write, I thought the best person to talk about this would be Patty, and that I would actually do an interview with her about her childhood and what it meant for her. And so that's that's where that chapter came came from. Her father was in one of these programs, but it really dictated her childhood. Um, other people that I knew who were involved in this space program had similar types of families and their kids were experiencing the same thing. And it's definitely not what you and I experienced when we were kids. It was not in any way a normal upbringing at all. So are there any wonderful cliffhangers in the book there? Just we'll, we'll leave a little taste of that. Do, does she reveal, did she see anything? Did she come into contact with anything interesting without telling them so they go and buy the book? Um, she, of course, does. And she and it's she in talks the book, it right? Well, it is in the book, yes. Right, good. Unlucky listeners, you're going to have to go and buy it. So last question, then. This one is back to Ray. Um, we could just talk all day about encounters, all the amazing stories, all the extraordinary people you've spoken to in your research. Um, but as I said, I really want them to just go out and experience the book for themselves, uh, having time for it to just sort of sink in into their own crania. Um, but I do want to get this last perspective on you on something that Ray Hernandez downloaded, to go back to that phrase that you use also in Encounters that Tyler talks about, while he was driving on a gridlock freeway, and it really got me thinking. So as you've explained, Ray was just, is just an atheist, an attorney with a Catholic wife, didn't believe in any of this stuff, started having these really intense experiences. After the experience with the dog listeners, he then started to, you know, he saw like a massive like football field size thing outside his house with like five other people. And not surprisingly, this really got him thinking. And he started contacting his friends and colleagues who were physicists, psychologists to see if they could help him understand it. And he went on to co-found the Dr. Edgar Mitchell Foundation for Research into Extraterrestrial and Extraordinary Experiences, or, or FREE. And he launched the first quantitative research survey on experiences, received questionnaires from 3,256 experiences, so over 100 countries, first international one as well about UAP, and about non-human intelligence. Um, I'll put the link in there. I won't go on about it, but it, 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 you know, there are problems with these kind of self-reported things, which, you know, I just let you check it out. It's just interesting and curious because it's quantitative. So you see the commonalities that Diana mentioned earlier, you know, there really are an extraordinary amount of similarities between, which I think is very reassuring for experiences who, who are often think that they're going crazy. Mm -hmm. no, it's going to be in the show notes. Anyway, just out of interest, so you know, guys, his new organization, Free is now closed. It's now called the CCRI, the Contact and Consciousness Research Institute. Anyway, Ray had this download experience. Um, and in this download, he got the idea that UFO experiences are part of a diverse set of paranormal contact modalities, which he calls them. This includes near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, remote viewing, spirit communication, psychedelics, reincarnation, and ESP. Um, and this was all part of his, his download. It was like a wheel of these various things. And uh, he received the information that somehow they're all using the same as yet unknown laws of physics to work. And that by studying this, we could find out what's missing in our theory of reality to explain all of these many uh, seemingly disparate anomalies. How nice it would be to explain all of them in just one jump of science, right? What do you make of a possible connection, Diana? We've already mentioned it. I, we mentioned it right from the start with bilocation between these seemingly disparate modalities. Diana. So I, I think Ray is definitely doing something important and his data is amazing. And I support his research. And I also think that it's true. So once you begin to understand that the people who are having these experiences of, say, UFO events are also having a lot of other experiences associated with them, but we tend, because we're trained by media, entertainment media, to believe that UFOs are just this, you know, this vehicle that comes down and 
there are beings and you know this kind of thing happens they go they go away that's the discrete event but it's actually not the event is an usually an ongoing event and usually accompanied by other types of what people would call either supernatural or paranormal events also and i include those in my book so every single person that i include in encounters i show the event that they have their ufo event but i also show the context and the ongoing either supernatural or paranormal events that they're experiencing. So you do think that he may be onto something in terms of there being a connection. Listeners, This is a lot of these uh, phenomena we're exploring individually on the show, speaking to individual researchers, many of them ridiculed for their work, many of them called out as pseudoscientific just because they are reporting the quantitative number of people having these experiences in detail and uh, in many cases, following them up years afterwards, speaking as Dana mentions about the transformative element that a lot of these people, their lives are permanently changed with quite extraordinary uh, consequences. I think it's understandable that there's a lot of fear and pushback. Um, in my interview about remote viewing, fear was what Laurie Williams said was the only thing really that's stopping people from taking on board the reality of these sort of non-local phenomena. Um, what do you think? Any closing thoughts, Dana, in terms of where you've landed with your epistemics? I mean, are you like Jack? Jack knows we're never going to pin it down. Is that where you've ended up or are you going to try and nail it down further as your career goes forward? Okay, so I would say that that's a false dichotomy, the, the way you set it up. And I would say that I'm Shakespearean. So, you know, I think we should embrace the mystery of it. That means that we data collect, figure things out, let it influence what we do and how we proceed with our technology and our academic research and you know the ways in which we live and uh, recognize that the mystery will probably always be mysterious. Dana Pastaga, very quickly, are you going to stick with this field? Surely you want to go back to miracles. It must be hard now you've got the bug. Okay, so right now what I I want to do and I'm working on is I believe that the, there are effects of the technology and they are being manifested in lots and lots of young people and the youth of at least the United States and I'm pretty sure all over. So what I'd like to do is to bring anything that I've learned and I've learned a lot about the protocols to to these communities and, and try to do something in my way to to uh, help. Are we speaking specifically about the influence of uh, sort of addictive, uh, invasive technologies, social media algorithms, this kind of thing, devices, or, or are you speaking about something else? No, I'm speaking about that. Okay. So we've got another book coming. Uh, maybe, you know, I feel like I, I'm assisting I can assist people who are doing these, you know, these, they have programs. And if I can assist, that's where I'll try to, to do some work right now. Well, then I definitely want to write back to you about that because um, it's, it's something I'm looking for the right guest on at the moment. You know, I'm very, very interested in the Center for Humane Technologies. I think they're doing great work there as well. A lot of pushback from the futurist community. Dana Pasolka, thank you so much for your time. You're a legend. Keep it up. It's been an absolute honor. Thank you so much.